Hello everyone. So we have come to our last topic in the programming languages course and that's historical perspective. So we're just going to talk about briefly uh, or to give to give a, a short uh, historical overview. <clears throat> so we we start uh, at the beginning of the first computer and the first computer languages and then we more or less take each um, decade here until uh, uh, around 2000. So, uh, as you know, the first uh, programming languages were machine languages. The first computers, which actually were mainframes at that time, large, huge actually, huge computers, very different from the ones that we have today because they were took up so much space and were so much less powerful than even small laptops or PCs that we have today. So the first computers appeared around 1950 and machine language, the underlying machine language of the computer was used for programming. And this language was composed of elementary instructions, for example, for adding, instructions for adding, for loading a value into a register and so on. And uh, the process of coding was completely manual. There were no uh, compilers, there, there were no uh, integrated environments uh, to use. And the programmer had to write the code in machine language Whereas today, we use compilers to compile our high-level language into a machine language. And there was not even this concept of uh, assembly code, which we will talk about in a minute. So machine languages are, are called the first generation languages. Now the second generation languages are called assembly languages. And those were introduced as a s s step away from machine languages towards uh, natural languages or towards the user natural language. Uh, however, these languages are very close to uh, machine languages. They are kind of a symbolic representations of the machine language. And often there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, machine language instructions and assembly uh, language codes. Uh, so instead of having to program in, mas in a machine language, which is just really a series of bits, zeros and ones, uh, the programmer could use symbolic representation. So in, uh, for example, he or she would be able to use uh, a, a, a command like uh, uh, add a a d d instead of having to write the equivalent bit code for that command. But of course then this assembly language needed to be translated into machine language and that, that was done through uh, an assembler. Uh, so I notice also that the, every model of a computer has its own assembly language. So the portability of these programs uh, is nearly impossible because when you write a program for uh, in an as assembly language for a given computer that program is unique you can't really compile it on a different uh, computer so assembly la we had machine languages as a first generation languages and then we had assembly languages as the second generation languages so, if we now look at the decade the uh, 1950s and 1960s, so the two decades. So, what happened during those decades is that high-level languages were introduced, and we also called them third. We also call them third-generation languages. And the characteristics here is that those are abstract languages which ignore the physical characteristics characteristics of the computer. 
So instead of having to write in a machine language, where there is, a, of course, a, a, where we are working very close to the underlying machine, or in an assembly languages where, where we are a little bit further from the underlying machine, but still we would have to uh, think about the underlying machine in, uh, when writing our solutions, we were provided with language it, languages that abstracted away some of the underlying details of the physical machine. And for example, those languages permitted the use of symbolic notation to indicate arithmetic expressions. So we could write x is equal to 2 times y as a symbolic notation instead of having to use assembly codes for that. And uh, FORTRAN, which uh, stands for Formula Translation, is, the, is often regarded as the first high-level language. And that language was, uh, was born in 1957. And FORTRAN is, is what is called an imperative language because it's based up upon a sequence of commands, sequence of imperatives, and this was developed by John Bacchus group in 1957 at IBM. And it was designed for a specific purpose, namely applications of uh, numerical or scientific type. Uh, and this was the first, uh, the first version contained indeed many constructs that were more or less independent of the specific machine. So as we talked about earlier, it has abstracted away some of the details of the of the underlying machine. Now, performance of the compiled code was an important issue in this first uh, implementation because uh, many people were actually skeptical that a compiler could be written that generated code which was as efficient, as good, as uh, written uh, by human, meaning that the machine language, which was for the output of the compiler, was as efficient as having been written by a, a human. So uh, a considerable investment was put into uh, optimizing uh, the code of uh, of the compiler, of the gener of the generated code that the compiler uh, output. Now this language has survived until today and is still used actually for, for many numerical applications, uh, often actually used in, in large machines, uh, not, not very common on, uh, on PCs. Whoops, looks like, looks like Adobe Reader crashed here. Let me just start it up again. Okay, finally here it is. So here uh, I'm just looking at the Wikipedia, the v Wikipedia entry for Fortran here. It says um, Fortran is a general purpose imperative programming language that is especially suited to numerical, numeric computation or scientific computing and originally de developed by IBM. So just uh, wanted to show you an example of Fortran code. So this is an example of the first versions of uh, uh, Fortran. So it introduced uh, symbolic notation, so what one you could use al algebraic notation like here. I, I, IA which is a variable plus IB plus IC and so on. This is, of course, something that we take for granted in uh, contemporary languages. And it, it had here like an if statement. This is actually called a three-way if. Uh, if 
this so this is an expression that is being evaluated and if it's negative there's a jump to the statement 777 uh, if it's uh, zero there's a jump to 777 and if it's positive there's a jump to 701 so this was called a three-way if that was introduced so the next uh, language that I mentioned here is alcohol and this is actually not a single language but uh, a family of imperative languages and uh, this was uh, this family was really introduced at the end of 1950s and was designed to to express algorithms in general not only in scientific uh, for solving scientific uh, problems like Fortran did uh, and this was actually an influential language because many of the concepts and constructs that are found in modern languages were introduced in alcohol. And just to name a few, blocks were introduced, blocks uh, that we use in contemporary languages like uh, C++ or Java. We, we, we open a block with a left uh, brack, uh, curly bracket and we close a block with a right curly bracket. Recursion was introduced in uh, alcohol. So recursion, for example, w was not uh, available in Fortran. Fortran was uh, had uh, a, a purely static memory allocation. Uh, type system, in the sense that the user could define his or her own types. And backwards noun form, because uh, alcohol was the first language that was described using a contest-free grammar. So using a BNF. So in, in in some of these slides, I have here links to to uh, Wikipedia, and uh, I'm not gonna uh, open the link in in all cases. So I suggest that you have a look if you're interested in reading more about the the particular language. Now Lisp is uh, of course a language that we are quite familiar with because we have been talking about it or discussing it in, in this course. Um, so this was the first functional language uh, and it's very interesting that it was uh, designed around the same time as the first imperative language, uh, namely Fortran. But this was designed in, in uh, 1960 or 1959 by a group led by John McCarthy at MIT. And this one was designed uh, especially for non-numeric applications. So like, like for solving symbolic expressions and was the uh, one of the uh, areas that uh, was uh, used in it, it was artificial intelligence. And uh, this language has not gained uh, a lot of popularity in the commercial sector, but in the academic world, Lisp still enjoys a following, for example, in the form of, of Scheme. And Scheme is exactly the language that we have been discussing in this course. Now, typically the language is implemented using an interpreter and programs are evaluated in, in an interactive environment. Like in our case, we have been using uh, Dr. Uh, Racket for, as an interpreter. And Lisp has had some contributions to uh, the programming language uh, development. Lisp introduced higher order functions, meaning functions could be sent as parameters to other functions and could be returned uh, as a result from functions. Now dynamic memory management using a heap, so instead of uh, instead of having uh, uh, memory statically allocated as was done in Fortran for example, uh, the programmer could explicitly um, allocate memory and that was uh, done dynamically at runtime and automatic garbage collection so the programmer didn't have to clean up or free memory but uh, the underlying runtime system took care of uh, collecting uh, the garbage. Now one language here that is uh, not much used uh, well, we could at least say not many new programs are implemented in this language. Well, for one thing, the language is quite old. It was designed in the 1960s, so this is COBOL, 
which stands for Common Business Oriented Language. And this was a language for business applications. So here you can see that many of the first languages were, were designed for a specific purpose in mind. And that's actually true for many contemporary languages as well. So uh, Fortran was designed for, for uh, numerical or scientific applications, uh, Lisp for symbolic expressions, COBOL for business applications. And an interesting aim here with this pr uh, language was uh, that the syntax should be uh, as close to the English language as possible. And uh, that means that the programs in, in this language consisted of statements like this, at years to age, as opposed to age is, is equal to age plus years, in, in which is uh, kind of a contemporary uh, syntax. So it was thought that this syntax would be easier for, for pr programmers to learn than this one. Now, even though this uh, language is not used uh, much for building new applications, still in 1997 uh, it says here that the, the Garden Group, according to some study by Garden Group, uh, an estimated 5 billion lines of new code was produced annually, which so that's actually quite a lot. And, and it reported in 1997 that 80% of the world's business ran on COBOL with over 200 billion lines of code. So this suggests that there's a lot of legacy code out there writ written in, in COBOL. And uh, maybe uh, 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 a lot of companies have not uh, dared to, to uh, rewrite their systems uh, using uh, more modern languages because uh, of the cost that would uh, incur. But still, I mean, this was in 1997, now we're in 2013, so this might have changed considerably since then. Since then. Now, Simula. Simula was the first object-oriented language. This was one of the languages that uh, were descendants of alcohol. We said earlier that alcohol had quite a lot of influence on the languages that came after it. And this one, again, uh, designed for a specific purpose, designed for simulation applications, uh, simulating some behavior, and developed at the, uh, from 1962 at the Norwegian Computing Center. Now, Simula 67 is uh, actually the one that is uh, best known. And that one introduced for the first time the concept of class and an object and a subtype, and indeed dynamic method dispatch. Remember, dynamic method dispatch, selecting the current, uh, the correct method to run at a runtime, depending on which object is receiving the, the corresponding message. So this uh, program language had a considerable influence on its successors, because uh, Smalltalk, both Smalltalk and C++, later introduced uh, uh, the, the same uh, concepts, like a class and uh, object and dynamic dispatching. Now, uh, the 1970s. The first one that is mentioned here is C, which often is referred to as the system programming language. This one was designed in, uh, in the 1970s by Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson at the AT and T Bell uh, Laboratories. Uh, it was uh, designed as a system programming language for Unix. That was the uh, original intent. But uh, later, it actually became a kind of a general purpose language that was, that was used uh, quite extensively in all, all uh, uh, kinds of sectors. Uh, when it came out, it offered more opportunities to access the low-level functionality of the machine, 
so often it was actually sometimes it is actually sometimes referred to as a middle level language uh, as opposed to a high level language because it also offers the programmer to communicate quite uh, close or work quite close to the underlying machine uh, now the block structure of C is considerably simpler uh, fire uh, not as it's considerably simpler I mean than the found uh, in the languages of the alcohol family and what do we mean here well the main thing is that C does not allow nested functions so we cannot have in C functions inside of functions but that's something that you could do in alcohol for example and later in in uh, in Pascal, which is the one that we mention here. So Pascal comes uh, out uh, approximately at the same time as C and uh, is often referred to as the educational language uh, because it was uh, most used in educational settings right up to the end of the 1980s. This one was developed by Nicholas Wirth, who later uh, uh, develop more uh, some other languages like Modula, Modula and Modula 2 and uh, this was a kind of a simplification of one of the alcohol languages alcohol W uh, now this one had quite an, uh, uh, an influence because it introduced for the first time the concept of intermediate code as an instrument for program portability um, and uh, well there's something missing here it should say is that it was actually the name of the uh, intermediate code uh, uh, is p-code which is uh, was used uh, uh, as a code for a uh, an abstract machine with a with a stack architecture so it had an influence on later languages like java for example because java came later out with this uh, intermediate code idea java java bytecode now pascal is a block structured language in which it's possible to def define functions and blocks that can be nested uh, with arbitrary uh, complexity uh, one of the things that made what was the reason that pascal was not much used in industry was the lack of separately compiled modules uh, but that was actually solved later in later version like in turbo pascal and object pascal which is also referred to as delphi now small talk we did discuss small talk briefly in this course often referred to, to as the true object oriented language um, developed during the 1970s by Alan Kay at Xerox, uh, Xerox Park and uh, one of the problems with the earlier languages was that they didn't have uh, strong enough mechanisms for uh, encapsulation and information hiding because they didn't have this concept of class and objects you could define abstract data types but you couldn't really prevent uh, operations that were not uh, appropriate on them when Smalltalk uh, introduced these uh, uh, the concept of class and objects it could guarantee that only certain operations were uh, performed on the on the data types and it also had precise visibility uh, rules for the classes uh, specifying whether the methods are public or well, actually all the methods are public and but instance variables are private so you couldn't acce access the instance variables unless going through to through public uh, methods and as we have discussed small talk was designed from the start to be a object uh, that everything was an object so rather than grafting it onto an existing language like was the case for C++ and also Smalltalk was designed to be a sort of a total system which included the, the language itself, the programming environment 
and a special dedicated machine, kind of an, a virtual machine for, for the program execution. Now we are we're still in this uh, in the 1970s, so there are quite a lot of uh, things that were going on during that decade. And here we mention ML, which is also a language that we have discussed in this course, um, meta language. So this is a, one of the functional languages or a declarative language, declarative in, in the sense that uh, we sp specify what needs to be done, but not exactly how it's carried out. And that was uh, Robin Smiller's group at Edinburgh that started this uh, development. Uh, and even though it's functional, this language, there were, there were some various imperative constructs that were added to it. And that actually made it, made the language uh, uh, a general purpose programming language. Now, uh, from the theoretical uh, viewpoint, the most important contribution of ML had to do with types. So the, the ML type checker st statically determines the type of every expression in a program. You can recall that from our, our discussion on, on, on ML. And there's no way to change this type. So it's clear at uh, compile time what is the type of each uh, expression. And also that the type system supports a type inference mechanism. So that means that uh, we don't have to specify the type of every variable or expression because the, the language can use a, a form of logical inference to deduce the type. Prolog was also uh, designed in the 1970s and that's a declarative logic language and the first impl implementation came out in 1972. And this was actually, Prolog was actually the first logic programming language. And as we have discussed, it was based on the unification algorithm. How to, an algorithm to unify two terms. And uh, in the unification process, the uh, variables uh, were instantiated, given values, in order for to, to prove uh, a, a specific uh, relation. So Prolog allows one to prove a formula by explicitly computing the values of the variables that make the formula itself true. And that's exactly what happens in the unification algorithm. And as we have talked about in declarative languages, the programmer takes care of the logic, in this case because we're talking about the logic language, and the abstract machine, which is the Prolog interpreter, takes care of the control part. So, now we're up to the 1980s. And the first language we mentioned here is C++, which we can say is the original C language along with object orientation. And the first version of C++ was defined by Bjarne Strostrup in 1986 at Bell Laboratories. Uh, and the most important issue was that classes and inheritance were added to the C language without compromising the efficiency of the language and compatibility with the existing C language. So that was one of the main design issues here that all the code that had been written in C could still be compiled with uh, the C++ compiler. So C had to really remain a subset of C++. Now, one th important thing is that templates were added which support parametric polymorphism. So for example, think of template classes and the way the objects were implemented is that they were really just a generalization of, of uh, the C struct. Now this second language that we mentioned here uh, in the 1980s is ADA, where the most important thing 
regarding this design is security. And uh, this def the definition of ADA was uh, sponsored by the U.S. Depart De Department of Defense. So there's no surprise that the, the sec security was a uh, number one issue. It, it started out uh, as a competition for the design of a new formalism, which would satisfy the requirements of the Department of Defense. So that's kind of a unique uh, approach to designing a language uh, to make it a kind of a, a competition. And this was won by uh, Jean Ichbia in 1979 with a language which was based on Pascal, which included many new constructs required for programming real-time systems and embedded systems. And one of the main contributions of ADA was uh, uh, in the field of concurrent programming, uh, which is a kind of uh, 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 parallel programming. So be able to run two processes at the, at the same time or two parts of a program. So, now we're in the 1990s. And not a big surprise, Java is the main language that we talk about here. Java is an object-oriented language, of course. Uh, that, that was the design, uh, one of the, the design issues. Um, even though not everything in the language is an object, because uh, the primitive types, int, bool, car, and so on, are, are not uh, objects. But still, there is no way of uh, writing a program uh, unless using a class. Uh, but it's interesting that uh, Java uh, was not initially thought of as a uh, language that had that there was going to be the language of the World Wide Web. In the initial project, which started in 1990, had the aim of defining a language based on a new implementation of C++ to be used in small computing devices. Uh, and those devices had uh, relatively limited power and they were con connected to a network. And then these devices were to implement a kind of a browser to be used for navigation through the network. So this was the original idea. It was just uh, some years later that was realized that actually this language had great potential in the World Wide uh, Web. Uh, uh, and especially when using applets, making which allowed the clients that were communicating to a server um, to run those small programs called applets on, uh, on their own. As opposed to write, uh, running the programs on the server, the server sent the applets to the client and the client was able to run them. And that actually caused uh, important design requirements, namely portability, because if uh, the server was going to send applets on the client to run them there, uh, the the applets, uh, or the the the, cl the clients themselves, uh, were of course of uh, different varieties, having different operating systems, uh, being uh, uh, different different computers with different different operating systems, um, different CPUs, and so on. Uh, so the the issue of portability was an important one, and that's that's why. Uh, the Java Virtual Machine uh, appeared and the associated bytecode because then the bytecode version of the applet was the one that was sent over to the client and the client would only need to have the Java Virtual Machine uh, and to be able to interpret the bytecode. Now the second one was the issue of security because uh, if sending an applet uh, over to a client, we, we didn't want uh, the uh, program to uh, crash on the, on the client side. And so there, were, there was a lot of uh, uh, work uh, done in the field of type safety, 
so no unsignaled errors would occur on the client. Uh, and another thing that was uh, thought of is uh, the avoidance of explicit pointer handling. So basically the pointer handling that uh, was part of the C and C++ language was removed from this new language uh, Java. So, in this short overview, there, there's of course uh, a lot of languages that we have not mentioned. The, the programming languages of the world are uh, hundreds if not, not thousands, and uh, in a short overview like this, of course we cannot uh, uh, talk about all of them. Uh, at the very end here I just uh, and mention a few examples of languages that we haven't talked about but still are, are quite well known like BASIC, um, Beginners All Symbolic Instruction Code in 1964, Eiffel 1986, Erlang 1986, F-Sharp which is the uh, functional language by Microsoft in 2008, Haskell one of the uh, true functional languages in 1990. Modula, this was uh, designed by uh, Niklas Wirth who designed Pascal, so this was in 1973. Operon, 1988, OCaml, uh, an object version of the CAM language in 1996. Perl and uh, Python, two languages that were originally designed for uh, as a scripting languages. PHP in 1985 as a server-side language, PL1 in 1964, one of the older languages that uh, runs on mainframes and are still used today, Ruby in 1993, uh, quite popular object-oriented language, Scala, quite a relatively new one, 2003, which is a general-purpose language with uh, which for example supports functional programming. SQL, which is of course uh, used for uh, querying databases, came out in 1970, and C Sharp, the language that is uh, that takes ideas from C++ and uh, Java, and came out, uh, which is, is a Microsoft language, and came out around uh, the year 2000. So this is just a, f uh, a list of uh, a few languages that that we didn't mention but are quite well known uh, in the programming languages world.